proposed bill, despite numerous objections raised by the DA, passed in the NA and was sent to the President for final sign-off. Fortunately, the President gave Parliament an opportunity to rework this badly written piece of legislation after raising several concerns, one of which was the constitutionality of the bills due to incorrect tagging. The bill was subsequently dealt with as a Section 76 bill, which brought it to us here in the NCOP to play our part as envisaged in the Constitution. Before we start with the serious flaws in the process followed both in the NCOP and the provinces, it must be stated up front that this is a badly written piece of legislation that might have noble intent, but in effect will have dire consequences for the industry. To partly illustrate this, I quote the following from RISA, the Recording Industry of South Africa, who already started the legal action. Open quote, the negative impact will primarily be felt by up and coming young South African musicians, fewer of whom will be offered recording contracts and by small and medium sized record companies who will not have the financial ability to continue to invest in new recordings by young artists to the same extent as they are currently able to do. A reduction in the number of new recordings by South African performers will also directly harm South African songwriters who will have fewer opportunities to have their new songs recorded and brought to market to earn royalties. Close quote. Throughout the process, Chair, this vast majority of inputs were negative towards the proposed legislation, and this was reflected in the negotiating mandates received from various provinces. Some, like Teng, had so many concerns with the legislation that they might as well have voted against it. Yet they stuck to the Tuli House line to rubber stamp these bills. And the rubber stamp of the ANC colleagues did happen. Whenever serious and valid concerns were raised, both the department and the provinces backed off to fight for the industry and what's right due to the undue pressure put on them by Parliament's Constitutionality and Legal Services Office. The department acknowledged that several of the proposed amendments and submissions received from the provinces were valid and should be incorporated. The permanent delegates correctly conveyed these substantive changes and asked the NCOP these should have been dealt with on its merits. However, once it was pointed out by Parliament's Constitutionality and Legal Services Office that certain changes to the bill would trigger the need for another round of public hearings, the department and the ANC delegates changed their positions and basically acknowledged that they would rather approve bad legislation than do a proper job, and subsequently left the relevant clauses unchanged. This is hugely problematic as it defeats the objectives as envisaged in the Constitution. It often felt like the legal advice that this, like the legal advice that the Select Committee received came of an agenda to push the legislation through. It is clear that the processes followed were fatally flawed and this legislation will be bad for the industry. We therefore call on the President to step up, not to sign it into law, and save the blushes of Parliament, his party, and millions of rand in taxpayers' money by not letting this bad bill be challenged in court as it is expected to be, should it be passed by Parliament. Colleagues from the ANC, you should be ashamed in how you conducted yourself serving your, your party instead of South Africa. Baranos, the Economic time. Alliance will no. not support this bad bill. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Badenos. We will now call Honourable Moimang. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, the... the he allowed me to rise to support uh, the performance protection bill on behalf of the ANC. The performance protection act is a law of 1967 that came before television was introduced in South Africa in 1976. The changes to the act are therefore urgent so that it is in line with our new democratic dispensation. They are urgent for actors, musicians, creators whose rights have not been met to date. These rights uh, are not respected by Mr. Badenhorst's party and this party's predecessors. The Performance Protection Amendment Bill is an important bill that provides for the rights of performers and ensure that their moral remuneration as well as the exclusive rights are taken into consideration. The bill also provides for protection of producers of sound recordings. As the ANC, we have full confidence in the process that was followed during the consultative processes, the public hearing, and also the interface that the that the uh, the province had 
uh, with the, the select committee as part and parcel of uh, ensuring that we're on top of the issues on this act. Parliament deliberated at length on the bill. A safe process was undertaken on the bill. During the public hearing provinces, the bill was deliberated. It is encouraging that much work went into the perform- performance protection amendment bill. In the consultation have ensued a sound bill. The performance protection amendment bill has been discussed and it is in alignment with the international treaties, such as the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual Performance and the WIPO Performance Performance and Phonographs Treaty. It was also advertised in both houses of parliament the public participation process on the bill was sufficient. Much was said about the need to delay the performance protection amendment bill from the copyright amendment bill. Part of the debate was that the performance rights are not part of copyright. It is important to note that we hold the view that the two bills are interlinked and should not be delinked. The structures of both acts have these interlinked cages. It can also be proven internationally that it is not new to have both in the same law. It's encouraging to note that the measures provided in the copyright amendment bill will be made available in the performance protection amendment bill because the link in this two bill is important. These measures include the copyright tribunal and the collecting societies. The copyright amendment bill strengthens the audiovisual work provision. The provisions the bill mirror those in the copyright amendment bill. It addresses the payment of royalties. The ability to earn and to receive equitable remuneration was a serious gap. The bill provides the standard elements of contracts to guide the performers and to ensure their contracts. It will provide for the minimum contractual terms to empower performers to know their rights when negotiating terms in contracts. Equitable contracts are needed for performers given the historical legacy of exploitation by big companies, right holders and publishers. There is the 25 year reversion right that addresses issues of assignment of rights. The reversion right will assist with assignments of rights in contracts and protect the interests of performers. In line with the Copyright Review Commission report, the bill limits the period of assignment to five years. The bill will be a victory for the rights and reputation of actors in the role they play in the creative industry of South Africa. The actors will now receive pay for their performance and the contract elements will strengthen their beginning power. The bill will cement their rights and protect their performance as well as how their images and persons are portrayed. The bill will provide for- Honorable member, your time. Three minutes, three minutes if left. In conclusion, Chair, the bill will provide a level playing field for performance. It will recognize the performance. The bill will take into account the development in digital sphere, and therefore the ANC supports the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable <laughs> Moiman. Honorable Dangor. Honorable Dangor. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chairperson. It's, uh, I'm making this declaration on the Copyright Amendment Bill, Deputy Chairperson. The standard and and elements for contracts are important. One of the features of the bill is that... Honorable Chair? Yes, Honorable Chai. We have not yet tabled the copyright, uh, Chair. Okay. This is still the Performance Amendment Bill, Honorable... My apology. My apology. I was just not sure because Honorable Moimang also spoke about the copyright thing. This is yeah. the performance amendment bill. You will be in the next two, uh, one of the next two vote, two uh, orders. Honorable Ma Marihane. Ma Marihane. Thank you, Honorable uh, Deputy Chairperson. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, uh, the performance protection amendment bill is an important bill addressing the interest of the of the performers performers have have faced several challenges over many years and they include the the lack of payment of royalties or <laughs> equitable remuneration and fair contracts and the legislation for that that is outside outdated and not aligned to the applicable international treaties obligations on moral uh, moral rights of performers. The bill provides for performers' economic rights and extends moral rights to performers in, in individual presentations, e.g. 
films. Moral rights include to claim to 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 be identified as the performer of their performa- performance, except where the omission is dictated to the manner of the use of the performers of the performance and to object to any ob- distortion, mutilation, or other mod- modification of their performance that would be that would be to their honor or equitable, taking due account to the nature of ad- ad- individual fixation or sound re- recording, recordings. The issue of moral right and the pro- protection of the image of the performance is an important provision in the bill. The moral rights granted to a performer shall be maintained after performer's death until the expiry of the economic rights granted to granted in terms of the bill or other relevant provisions of the Copyright Act. Exclusion F Exclusion economic rights of performance. The right that the bill provides for a for a, you have you have muted yourself, Honorable Mama Rehane. Mama Rehane, you've muted yourself. Mama Rehane, we don't hear you. Mama Rehane, we don't hear you. We don't hear you. And your time is in your time has lapsed. Your time has lapsed, and we didn't hear you. So uh, I, we really didn't hear you. We didn't hear you, and uh, the time has lapsed for your for the motion. You, you, I told you in the beginning it's three minutes. The declaration. Thank you, thank you, David Chappell. Thank you. We shall now proceed to the voting on the question. And the question is that the bill be agreed to. And I will now call upon provinces to cast their votes. And when called upon, heads of delegations must indicate whether they vote in favor of against or abstain. Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape, Eastern Cape. Yes. Eastern Cape yes. And Cosima, Free State. Free State vote in favor, Chaperson. Thank you very much. Gauteng. Oh, thank in favor, Chairperson. Thank you very much. KwaZulu Natal. KwaZulu Natal, abstain, Chairperson. Thank you, Limpopo. Limpopo, vote in favor, Honorable David Chairperson. Pumalanga. Pumalanga, vote in favor, Honorable Deputy Chair. Thank you, Northern Cape. Northern Cape, vote in favor, Honorable Chair. Northwest. Northwest, Western Cape. Western Cape against. Thank you. Six provinces have voted. One have abstained. Northwest was absent. And Western Cape is against. So the voting is now closed. And in terms of my Mets, I think that we therefore agreed to the bill in accordance with Section 65 of the Constitution, since the majority have agreed. Honorable delegates, we will now proceed to the second order. Consideration of Copyright Amendment Bill, National Assembly Section 76, and the report of Select Committee on Trade and Industry, Economic Development, Small Business Development, Tourism, Employment, and Labor thereon. ATC report 8 September 2023, page 5. And I will now call on the Honorable M. I. Hai Manla, Chairperson of the Select Committee on Trade and Industry, Economic Development, Small Business Development, Tourism, Employment and Labor, to present the committee report. Honorable Hai, it's over to you and you've got 10 minutes to present the report. Thank you very much uh, once again, uh, Honorable Deputy Chair. Uh, the Copyright Amendment Bill was passed by the Fifth Parliament and at the time it was classified as a Section 75 Bill. Thereafter, it was sent to the President for assent. The President subsequently sent it back uh, to Parliament. 
with the reservation of which one of them was the tagging uh, of the bill at section 75. Uh, the National Assembly then uh, amended the remitted bill uh, to section 76. The purpose of the bill, uh, Honorable Deputy Chair, is to amend Copyright uh, Act of 1978 so as to define certain words and expressions to allow for further limitation and exceptions regarding the reproduction of copyright work. In addition, to provide for equitable remuneration or the sharing of royalties in copyright works, to provide for the payment of equitable remuneration or royalties in respect of literary, musical, artistic, and audiovisual works, further to provide for the resale of royalty rights, to provide for recordal and reporting of certain acts, further to provide for accreditation of collecting societies, to provide for a mechanism for settlement of disputes. In addition, to provide for access to copyright works by persons with disabilities, further to provide for the licensing of orphan work, to strengthen the powers and functions of the copyright tribunal, further to provide for prohibited conduct in respect of technological protection measures, to provide for the prohibited conduct in respect of copyright management information. In addition, to provide for protection of digital rights, to provide for certain new offenses, and to finally provide for matters connected herewith. The process follow uh, with the bill. The Copyright Amendment Bill was passed by the National Assembly, transmitted to the National Council of Provinces, and referred to the Select Committee on Trade and Industry Economic Development, Small Business Development, Tourism, Employment and Labor on the 1st of September, uh, 2022. The Select Committee held capacity building session on the 18 and 25 October and invited relevant portal committees from all nine provincial legislatures. The purpose of the session was to introduce members to the highly technical aspects of the bill. The Department of Trade, Industry and Competition briefed the committee on the 25th of October 2022. The committee advertised the bill for public comment. The closing date for submission was 27th January 2023. The committee held public hearings on the 21st of February, 7 and 14 of March. Uh, provincial legislatures held public hearings on the bill between, the, between February and May 2023. The Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and Parliamentary Legal Advisor responded to issues raised during the public hearings on the 6th and 13th of 2023, or June 2023. Thereafter, negotiating mandate meetings were held on the 13th, 14th, and the 20th of June, 2023. The committee set during the recess to consider and adopt the e-list of proposed amendments in relation to the bill on the 1st of August, 2023. On consideration of final mandates, all provinces submitted final mandates, which were considered on the 5th of September, 2023. The final mandates were submitted as follows. Eastern Cape voted in favor of the bill. Uh, Free State voted in favor of the bill. Gauteng voted in favor of the bill. KwaZulu-Natal abstained from voting. Limpopo voted in favor of the bill. Pumalanga voted in favor of the bill. Northern Cape voted in favor of the bill. Northwest voted in favor of the bill. Western Cape voted, uh, voted against uh, the bill. <laughs> The Select Committee on Trade and Industry, Economic Development, Tourism, Employment and Labor, having deliberated on and considered the subject of the Copyright Amendment Bill, B13F-2017, referred to it as classified by JTM as Section 76 Bill, report that it has agreed to an amendment Bill 13 or b 13 f a dash 2017. I so table the report. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. The two bills are similar, uh, Chairperson. They are linked. We've been dealing with them simultaneously. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Hai. Honorable Delegates, I will now put the question. And the question is that the bill be agreed to, but 
Before we proceed to the voting, I shall allow provinces the opportunity to make their declarations of vote in terms of Rule 86, if they so wish. And provinces can indicate, Honorable Badenos. Honorable Badenos. Thank you. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, thank you. Once again, the Copyright Amendment Bill was introduced in the National Assembly and subsequently referred to the Portfolio Committee on Trade, Industry and Competition on 15th of May 2017. The proposed bill, despite numerous objections raised by the DA, passed in the NA and was sent to the President for final send-off. Fortunately, the President gave Parliament an opportunity to rework once again this badly written piece of legislation after raising several concerns, one of which was the constitutionality of the bills due to incorrect tagging. The bill was subsequently dealt with as a Section 76 bill, which brought it to us here in the NCOP to play our part as envis envisaged in the Constitution. Before we start with the serious flaws in the processes following both the NCOP and provinces, it must be stated up front that this is a really badly written piece of legislation, but that might, might have a little bit of noble intent, but in effect it will have dire consequences for the industry. Throughout the process, the vast majority of inputs were negative toward the proposed legislation, and this was reflected in the negotiating mandates received from various provinces, as we just heard read to us. Some, like Hapteng, had so many concerns with the legislation that they might as well as voted against it. Yet, again, they stuck to the Lutuli House line to rubber stamp these bills. And rubber stamp the ANC colleagues did, like little ducks in a row. Whenever serious and valid concerns were raised, both the department and the provinces backed off to fight for the industry and what's right due to the undue pressure put on them by Parliament's Constitutionality and Legal Services Office. The department acknowledged that several of the proposed amendments and submissions received from the provinces were valid and should have been incorporated. The permanent delegates correctly conveyed these substantive changes and asked the NCOP these should have been dealt with on its merits. However, once it was pointed out by Parliament's Constitutionality and Legal Services Office that certain changes to the bill would trigger the need for another round of public hearings, the Department and the ANC delegates changed their positions and basically acknowledged that they would rather approve bad legislation and do a proper job, and subsequently left the relevant clauses unchanged. This is hugely problematic, as it defeats the objectives as envisaged in the Constitution. It often felt like the legal advice that the Select Committee received came with an agenda to push the legislation through. It is clear that the processes followed were fatally flawed and this legislation will be bad for the industry. We therefore again call on the President to step up, not to sign it into law and save the blushes of Parliament, his party and millions of rands in taxpayers' money by not letting this bad bill be challenged in court as it is expected to be, that it should be passed by Parliament. Colleagues from the ANC, once again, you should be ashamed in how you conducted yourself serving your party instead of South Africa. The Democratic Alliance will not support this bad bill. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Honorable Badenos. Honorable Dangor. Honorable Dangor. Chairperson, thank you. I would have yielded to, to Honorable Muemang first. He's more senior than me. And then okay. I would have followed him. It's fine if you will just add. I will then I will call Honorable Moimang. Thank you. So thank you, thank ask. you, thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, allow me uh, to rise uh, in support uh, of this uh, copyright amendment bill, and we have full confidence in the process that was followed, the engagement that you have had with the provinces, and also through the interaction that you have had with the parliamentary legal advisors and also the the uh, the, the department uh, uh, legal advisors. The copyright amendment bill is a significant milestone and an achievement for the authors, for the creators, and rights holders in South Africa. This is a huge milestone because the act came into effect in 1978, and it has been more than 40 years since it came into operation. Therefore, it needed to be transformed, it needed to be infused with the new dynamic that is emerging. The bill provides for the royalties for a critical remuneration in the musical or literary, audiovisual work, visual artistic works, and also 
ensures that the royalties or equitable remuneration addresses the differences of the sectors. The Copyright Amendment Bill gives authors and creators a new rise to increase their income. The bill makes provision that all authors are fairly paid. Honorable uh, Deputy Chair, it's important to also note that uh, the passing into law of the Copyright Amendment Bill will introduce new changes that are going to transform how the copyright-based industries have been organized for decades. The provision will empower the authors, the other creators, copyright owners, and will create an enabling environment for all role players, including users and consumers. With change comes resistance and uncertainty. Hence, Mr. Badenholz's cry baby tactic. The Copyright Amendment Bill should be adopted by this House and passed into law to ensure a balanced creative sector that protects and ensures all concerned can thrive in the economy and society. Of critical uh, importance, Chair, during this uh, interaction has been the issue of fair use. One of the most significant amendments to the bill is the introduction of fair use general exception. Parliament deliberated extensively on fair use. The fair use exception introduced in section 12A of the bill introduced an important amendment that will ensure the use of copyright works in a transparent manner. Fair use limits on the exclusive rights of a copyright holder and provide for access to copyright materials in their public interest. But to Bailey, there is a need to maintain a balance between the rights of authors or creators and the large public interest. Fair use is a doctrine under copyright law that permits certain uses of work without the copyright holder's permission, for example, in news reporting, scholarship and research, personal use, criticism, or review, or when making comment on a published work. It allows users to make use of copyright work without permission or payment when the benefit to society outweighs the cost to the copyright holder. Fair use differs from the current doctrine of fair dealing in the Copyright Act, which consists of a closed list of exceptions. Any use that falls outside the scope of the exception listed in their fair dealing is considered to be an infringement. The fair dealing doctrine is fairly restrictive and costly and does not cater for education and access to information. The concern that fair use will affect the income of authors or creators and that it will lead to exploitation of the creative works and result in economic losses is exaggerated and causing unsubstantiated alarm in society. Fair use has factors that will inform the use of work and this will restrict use of works. There is confusion about fair use and free copy of works. The fair use factors restrict how the work can be used and the bill provides guidance and certainty. The factors include the nature of the work in question, the amount and substantiality of the part of the work affected by the act in relation to the whole work of the whole of the work, the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use serves a purpose different from that of the work affected. And if it is a, of a commercial nature or for non-profit research, library or educational purpose, the free copy of works is piracy. And that is currently taking place under fair dealing and not a fair use problem. The fair use provision will not negatively impact creators and the economy despite the strong use raised by those who oppose the bill. This safeguards in the bill will help to mitigate again piracy. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Moima. Honorable Dango, you still want to continue? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. I wish to continue. Chairperson, I stand in support of the bill and will focus upon particular elements. The standard elements for contracts. One of the features of the bill is that it encourages the prescribing of a standard elements of agreements to be entered into by the creators. These provisions carry a historical context to them because of the challenges many of the authors faced <clears throat> under unfair contracts. 
and many who never received CANT contract or royalties at all, or equitable remuneration. It should be highlighted that the regulation of contractual terms is a common governmental responsibility as seen in other countries such as Germany. Strengthening the Copyright Bill Another important amendment of the bill is strengthening the copyright tribunal that will deal with the, with the disputes that arise related to the bill. A dispute resolution mechanism is very important because it will ensure uh, cost-effective and voluntary remedial mechanisms to the copyright-related uh, disputes. Collecting societies. South Africa has a serious regulatory gap in the collection societies. Over the years, members have been exploited and the lack of a clear governance requirements has caused many challenges with these regulations. The bill will ensure the proper accreditation and governance of collecting societies. They will be more ac accountable and to their members and payments for the royalties of equitable remuneration that is much needed. The resale of royalty rights. The introduction of resale of royalty rights is, a welcome, is welcome because it will ensure efforts of visual artistic works are also catered for to their original works and are, are traded in the resale market. The visual artistic work include paintings, scriptures, drawings, um, engravings, as well as photographs. And there's a new, this is a new royalty regime. Consultations. There was more than sufficient consultation in the Copyright Amendment Bill. The consultations went back and as far as 2009 and outside of the parliamentary process addressed uh, by government. The consultations took place in all of a uh, uh, place in the 15th, uh, fifth parliament and uh, in the sixth parliament took place in all of the provinces. The socioeconomic impact of the assessment uh, bill. Uh, there, will, there are concerns raised about the economic impact of the assessment system of the crit by critics of the bill. It is important that this goes through as uh, the initial draft copyright amendment comment on the 27th of July 2015, which was before the, the CS. Uh, Deputy Chairperson, I want to come to a comment made by the Honorable Badenost regarding the legal um, services department of the parliament. Let's it's, take into account your time, please, Honorable yeah. Member. Uh, mm. I, uh, in conclusion to say, I think it's an unfair, unfair uh, criticism of the legal services department of parliament. Um, and uh, that, I think, should be addressed uh, and corrected. Thank you very much. He was criticizing the members, not the department. Thank you very much, Honorable Ryder. Please, you have a request to speak. Can we continue? Uh, thank you very much also to the, uh, to the members that uh, participated in this uh, engagement on declarations. Just, I just wanted to make an observation, and I want to express my appreciation to Honorable Dangor, specifically that he mentioned that in an international context, because this specific beyond is very it's very like controversial internationally so uh, i thought i just wanted to make that observation but fortunately i feel i'm covered by what honorable dango brought into discussion so we shall now proceed to the voting on the question and the question is that the bill be agreed to so i will now call upon the provinces to cast their votes when called upon heads of delegations must indicate whether they vote in favor against or abstain Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape, yeah, for my chair. Thank you very much. Free State. Free State supports, chair. Thank you. Gauteng. Gauteng supports, chair. KwaZulu-Natal. 
It was a lunatal abstain, Chairperson. Thank you, Limpopo. Limpopo. Limpopo support the bill. Thank you, Mpumalanga. Limpopo Mpumalanga. support, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. I heard you, Honorable Mama Rekhane. Mpumalanga. Mpumalanga, vote in favor, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Northern Cape. North Cape support, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Northwest. Thank you, Western Cape. Western Cape opposed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Honorable members, the voting is now closed. And seven provinces voted in favor of the bill. One abstained and one voted against, which means the bill is agreed to in accordance with Section 65 of the Constitution. Thank you. We will now proceed to the third order. Honorable Delegates, the third order is the consideration of the fundraising amendment bill. National Assembly Section 76 and the report of Select Committee on Health and Social Services thereon. ATC Report 22 September 2023. And I will now call on the Honorable Edward Z. Njadu Zoe Sile, Chairperson of Select Committee on Health and Social Services, to present the committee report. Over to you, Honorable Njadu, and you've got 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. Good afternoon to all the members. Uh, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, the fundraising amendment bill, Bill 29, B29, B2020, National Assembly Section 76, dated 20, 22nd of September 2023. The Fundraising Amendment Bill 2020 aims to uh, rationalize the Fundraising Act 1976, Act Number 107 of 1978, Apology 1978, by cons consolidating the Disaster Relief Fund, the Refugee Relief Fund, the Social Relief Fund, and the State President's Fund into the Disaster Relief and National Social Development Fund. So as to focus on proacting mitigation of disasters and promote the social development of communities. The consolidation of the funds will streamline the administrative processes and enable more efficient services to poor communities and reduce cost. Dear Honorable Deputy Chairperson, um, the report of the Select Committee on Health and Social Services on the Fundraising Amendment Bill, which is Bill 29B of 2020, the Select Committee on Health and Social Services, having considered the subject of the Fundraising Amendment Bill, B29, B2020, National Assembly Section 76, referred it to reports that it has agreed to the bill. Process, the Fundraising Amendment Bill, Bill 29, B2020, was referred to the committee on the 28th of September, 2023. Um, 2022, the Department of Social Development briefed the committee on the on uh, on 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 the 16th of May 2023. All provinces had brief briefings and public hearings on the bill between 2024 20, May and 25 of August 2023. All provinces concluded their public hearings by 25 of August 2023. All provinces submitted the negotiating mandates on the 5th of August, September 2023. The committee finalized the bill on the 22nd of September 2023 and adopted it without amendments. Dear Honorable uh, Deputy Chair, all provinces supported 
and this report is tabled for consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Njadu. I just want to go to the to the guide. So, uh, thank you very much, Honorable Njadu. Uh, the, we will now put the question. And the question is that the bill be agreed to. But before we proceed to the voting, I shall allow provinces the opportunity to make their declarations of vote in terms of Rule 86, if they so wish. Maximum three minutes per declaration. I'm just repeating it for the record. Honorable Badenos. Thank you, Honorable, Honorable Deputy yes. Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Deputy Chair, the objectives of the Fundraising Amendment Bill serve to highlight the many lessons the COVID-19 pandemic taught us as a country. One of these lessons related to the creation of haphazard legislation did not necessarily translate into smooth implementation. We are consequently mindful that this proposed amendment bill has the potential to not fully achieve its objectives of improving the situation of those it is meant to serve after becoming law. Consolidating the four funds into one fund for quicker disaster resource allocation is, however, a logical step which the Democratic Alliance supports. It is evident that the Department of Social Development must have learned vital lessons from recent crises like the COVID-19, the floods and the mutants. These lessons stress the importance of rapid coordination to protect vulnerable individuals, particularly children, by avoiding delays caused by bureaucracy, capacity limitations and working in isolation. Money needed during emergencies should not remain locked in dormant disaster relief funds, as has been witnessed in recent disasters and during the COVID-19 lockdown. Additionally, close collaboration between the Department of Social Development and established MPOs is essential. Such a partnership would have prevented long queues and other distressing scenes. Yet another lesson is that of ensuring coordination amongst all spheres of government to avoid the many reports of ill treatment, channeling of much needed resources based on political affiliation, and the fragmentation of processes to access food by many deserving individuals and families. We call on the Minister and the Department to streamline resource allocation for the poor and vulnerable, prioritizing speedy responses. This is crucial for ensuring the survival of those who rely on the Constitution's protections and its associated laws during disasters. As a, as a democratic alliance, we've learned these lessons and we will apply them when we assume government in 2024. I thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Honorable Pardonos. If there is no other declaration, we shall proceed to the voting on the question. And the question is that the bill be agreed to. So I will now call upon the provinces to cast their votes. And we, when call upon, head of delegations must indicate whether they vote in favor, against, or abstain. Eastern Cape? Eastern Cape, yeah, my chair. Thank you, Free State. Is there support, chair? Thank you, Houting. Houting in favor, chair. Thank you, KwaZulu Natal. It was Zulu Natalia, yes, sir. Asha, Zumbi. Nyabongama. Limpopo. Limpopo. Limpopo vote in favor. Limpopo vote in favor. Thank you. Limpopo. Limpopo vote in favor. Debit Chepper said. When I, I'm no, I don't know why you think I'm deaf. Mpumalanga. Mpumalanga supports the PTJ. Thank you, Northern Cape. Northern Cape support the preacher. Northwest. Northwest no, is Modise. Northwest, yeah, I support them. I support Western Cape. Western Cape will support this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. The voting is now closed. All provinces voted in favor. And I therefore declare the bill agreed to in accordance with Section 65 of the Constitution. Honorable delegates, before we proceed to the subject for debate, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the Deputy Minister, MECs, and all permanent and special delegates to this House. 
We shall now proceed to the subject for debate, that is tourism, building viable tourism spaces and facilities for local economic development. I will call on the House Chairperson, Honorable Nguenya, to take over the presiding over the House. Honorable Nguenya. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Chair. Honorable Delegate, we shall now proceed to the subject for the tourism building, vulnerable tourism space and facility for local economic development. I'll now call upon Honorable F. Mahalela, Deputy Minister of Tourism, to open the debate. Honorable F. Masalela. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, thank uh, you. I was very much. 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 I was very yeah, I'm very for me so. Can you see your face on a room? Yes, I can answer to Yeah, we've only been using Zoom for three years. Uh, so yes. I can, I can, I can, yeah, there you oh, are. Again. Nah, so. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can the honorable members uh, of the NCOP uh, and the delegates MSCs who are part of this gathering. Uh, how chair our government view infrastructure as a critical aspect in achieving South Africa's long-term goals of economic and social development. Investing in infrastructure is key in gaining greater productivity and competitiveness as it supports the emergency of new jobs in the tourism sector and other sectors. Our government regards public infrastructure as non-negotiable foundation for transformation and inclusive growth. It, it also generates employment and broad-based economic empowerment opportunities and further contributes to the goals of the National Development Plan. The National Tourism Sector Strategy places tourism as the nexus of economic growth and development of our country. Therefore, tourism infrastructure is considered critical for tourism and destination competitiveness. Within the context of South, Af South African public, systems, the responsibility of infrastructure and tourism planning lies with multiple departments in all the spheres of government, national, provincial, and local sphere. Tourism infrastructure needs needs can therefore be addressed through integrated planning. Private sector investment in tourism infrastructure usually follows public sector investment. We view the local economic development as an approach towards economic development, which allows and encourages local people to work together to achieve sustainable economic growth and development, thereby bringing economic benefits to an improved quality of lives of all residents in the local municipality. Our topic, therefore, 
demands of all of us to work relentlessly to bring these sustainable economic growth to the local people through investment in a viable tourism space and facilities. Through LGA, government aims to maximize the economic potential of all municipalities, localities through the country and to enhance the resilience of the macroeconomic development through increased local economic growth, employment creation, and development initiatives within the context of sustainable development. The local LED demonstrates that the political jurisdiction at the local level is often the most appropriate place for economic intervention as it creates alongside the accountability and legitimacy of democratically elected body. The government through the local economic development is intending to build the capacity of all local areas to improve its economic future and quality of life for inhabitants. The 1996 Tourism White Paper outlined the role of tourism in economic development and it said, and I quote, the tourism industry provides enormous, enormous potential to create linkages and dynamize other sectors of the economy, be it to agriculture, manufacturing, and services. South Africa, more than any other country in the rest of Africa or the world, has the potential to supply almost every need of the tourism sector, from meat and poetry, beverages and wines, to vehicles, to machinery, furniture, cut flowers, jewelry, diamond, and more. Tourism will, will generate demand and production in other sectors of the economy. The white paper, which you are currently reviewing, and we will table in this August House in due course after cabinet approval. Further state that, however, unless tourism is viewed and developed as a strategically important industry, the greatest engine of growth to the South African economy, the, the, true, wealth, the true wealth creating potential of tourism sector will never be realized. It further argues that international tourism is the only export item which is exported without leaving the country. It further talks to the tourism sector as having the potential for South Africa to influence visitor taste and create permanent export markets as very real. However, the fact that the export item is consumed on site, unlike other export items that are taken to the buyer, the local government and the local destination look and feels the very important that uh, the consumer or the visitor. The experience on how, in, in how they access the destination, be it through an airport, land, border post, or harbor is very critical. The roads in which they, are, they, they drive, the hotel in which they stay, the mall and the attraction they visit, or their ability to make a phone call or connect to the internet is critical in ensuring that tourists or visitors stay longer in the destination and spend more. It will also depend whether they come back or not. Repeat visitation is a cornerstone of our sector or any other sector for that matter. However, the bar of tourism sector is very high. The topic for this debate requires a whole country approach. All stakeholders should have a critical role in the production of experience that will ensure that our visitors stay longer and also spend more 
and that they will also come back uh, to our localities time and again. There is a constant need to people and other government departments, private sector communities, the latest travel trends uh, and the consumption pattern of the modern travelers so that local government and other stakeholders prepare themselves better, meaning that the tourism spaces and facilities cater for the needs of the visitors. Responsible tourism is the corner of policy as it should be tourism that contributes to sustainable development as the World Tourism Organization argues. Tourism that takes full account of its current and future economic, social, and environmental impact addresses, addressing the needs of the visitors, the industry and environment, and the host communities. The UNWCO further states that sustainable tourism should, one, make optimal use of environmental resources that constitute the key element in tourism development, maintaining essential ecology, ecological processes and helping uh, to conserve natural heritage and biodiversity. Respect the socio-economic authenticity of host communities, conserve their build and living cultural heritage and tradition values, and contribute to their intercultural understanding and tolerance. Ensure viable long-term economic operations, providing socio-economic benefits for all stakeholders that are fairly distributed, including stable employment and income earning opportunities and services to host communities and contributing to poverty eradication. As a Department of Tourism, we've implemented some programs such as Universal Accessibility, the Green Tourism Incentive Program, the Working for Tourism Program, where we assist communities to build tourism assets in order to maximize leakages. The National Framework for Local Economic Development states that while the Constitution of 1996 places greater responsibility on the municipality to facilitate LEDs, the schedule in the Constitution that lists the functions of the municipality does not include LED. This has contributed to the an interpretation that sees LED as an unfunded mandate for municipalities. There is a clear implication given the juxtaposition of the Constitution and its scale that municipalities have a key role in creating conducive environment for investment through the provision of infrastructure quality services, rather than by developing programs and attempting to create jobs directly. The national framework uh, for, for further states, municipalities should play a corner role in respect of LED, drawing upon resources locked in different range of department that supports institutions. For example, the municipality can draw the funding from sector education and training authorities set up address the skills development in their communities. They can also draw the support of small enterprise development agents and other agencies from the Department of Trade, Industry and Implementation and National Sector Department to assist with the retention and growth of the enterprise. Besides government support, the range of non-governmental support initiatives that municipal can tap into the resources. Tourism in rich municipalities can anchor their LED strategy around tourism. As I demonstrated earlier, how the tourism sector can unlock value in other sectors of the economy. Tourism rich municipalities are also are those located near major attractions of Kruger National Park, as well as other national parks popular with the both domestic and international tourists. Honorable members, will agree with me when I say that there will be no Pumalanga Kruger National International Airport without Kruger National Park. The East Gate Airport will have remained just a military base when, it, when, when, when there was no Kruger National Park. The same could be said with George Airport, to mention a few. 
I've indicated in other platforms that extensive work by the department in maintaining infrastructure in some of our major attraction, even though some might consider those interventions not being our core function, was informed by the fact that they, they could not wish to see some of these major attractions collapse as, as will have a negative impact on visitation in those areas by implication the LED. It is also critical that the work happening inside the protected areas, infrastructure and maintenance program and intervention is all supported by work outside the parks through the intervention by both municipalities as well as the private sector. The following supply is an example of need att attention, namely access roads, airports accommodation from budget to, fa to first five stars hotel, amenities hotel hotels, malls, broadband, as well as awareness. Locals need to appreciate the rural tourism sector plays in the economy and in their lives. As indicated earlier, private sector interventions such as at it, it is gate airport, new accommodation establishment in Wood Spread, open gate road in Kruger National Park, play a very critical role in ensuring that our supply is able to handle the anticipated demand estimated by destination marketing efforts by the SAT, provincial tourism agencies, as well as municipalities promoting intervention. The private sector and the public sector intervention highlighted above have direct bearing into the demands in agriculture, such as eggs, fruits, uh, and, and vegetables. Manufacturing goods, such as toilet paper, soft drinks, linen furniture, and services such as transport demand for faster internet and laundry services. The airports and other strategic projects will tell us about the increased number of employees there to employ after the upgrades with new accommodation establishment, having created jobs during the construction as well as during the establishment and during the operations. Tourism stakeholders need to work closely with municipality in ensuring that zoning saves the long-term interest of the tourism sector and local communities. Let me conclude a uh, program director by saying, the South African sector planning system is well established and complex. It has been criticized by producing excellent plans on paper, but do not achieve the desired integration between the sectors. Despite the planning process requiring intersectional and intergovernmental coordination, planning still occurs in silos, regardless of the introduction of the district development model. The tourism sector currently does limited planning for tourism infrastructure, and this is mainly related to budget constraints. The annual tourism budget available for infrastructure is on an average of 200 million, particularly for tourism infrastructure priorities across South Africa, which you will agree with me that is too likely, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Malibong, MGM. Thanks very much, uh, Honorable Member. Uh, now I would like to call Honorable M. Hai, African National Congress. Thank Honorable you very much. Hai. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable House Chairperson. Greetings to you. Uh, yes. Greetings to the DPT Chairperson. Uh, House Chairperson for uh, Committees, uh, Chief Whip, and the uh, Deputy Minister of uh, Tourism, and their uh, fellow uh, South Africans. Uh, if you are free, if you are to free yourself, you must break the chains of oppression yourselves. Only then can we express our dignity. Only when we have liberated ourselves can we cooperate with other groups. Any acceptance of humiliation indignity or insult is acceptance of inferiority. Those were the words of Mamwini Matigizana Mandela, a militant and fierce anti-apartheid activist.
sorry, check. A fierce, those were the words of Mamwini Mandizela Mandela, a militant and fierce anti apartheid activist who remained a staunch and loyal member of the African National Congress till her last breath. Today, 26 September 2023, our comrade and mother, who have who would have turned 87 years old, we wish her a revolutionary birthday. We will continue to cherish her story of resilience. Resistance and remarkable strength as an armor of source of inspiration as we continue to fight to heal the division of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, lay the foundation for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people. And every citizen is equally protected by law, improve the quality of life of all citizens, and free the potential of each person and build a united democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nation as enshrined in the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. Sadly, Honorable House Chairperson, uh, the granddaughter of uh, uh, Comrade Winnie Matigizela Mandela uh, passed away a day before her birthday uh, of the 26th uh, September. We would like to express our uh, heartfelt condolences uh, to Matiba family, and uh, we pray that God uh, will bring comfort and strength to the family uh, of Matiba. Honorable members, the concept of local economic development can be referred to as a process in which partnership between local government, NGO, community-based groups, and the private sector are established to manage existing resources to create jobs and stimulate the economy of that particular area. This is a concept that finds resonance in the words of the late Mamwini Matigizela Mandela in the quote I have cited, which encourages us as people of this beautiful nation to fight for what is rightfully ours. We all deserve to live in a South Africa that is a growing economy where our state organs are functioning optimally, where social services are sufficient for all, and where there is a low rate of crime. Fellow South African, it takes each one of us playing our part, small as it may be, wherever we are, working with organized labor, business, and community organization towards an industrial plan for localization. The ANC government has done the following, among others. Built industrial capacity to address the COVID-19 pandemic through production of locally produced goods, including medical supplies and equipment. Finalized and implemented plans for localization and local procurement, to name a, a few examples. In the outer sector, where there's a commitment to increase the local content of South African assembled motor vehicles, from current 39% to 60% and provide direct financing and procurement to local enterprises in their supply value chain. The clothing and textile, where there is a commitment to increase the locally made goods sold by the South African retailers from 44% to 65%, including Foshini Group, Pick and Pay and Pep, amounting to billions of rent of support to local businesses in their supply value chain. Poultry, where there is a commitment to expand poultry production and government implemented anti damming duties. Large poultry firms are obliged to support the emergence of new players in the market. On sugar, where there is a commitment by large sugar mills and farmers to support small farmers with 200 million rents a year, and large retailers and food companies buying local sugar. Tourism has been prioritized as one of the biggest growth industries in South Africa. Therefore, all spheres of government, 
using the LED approach, have been prioritizing the development of local tourist sites and facilities, improving security, and ensuring that the environments are receptive and conducive to host tourists and building social cohesion. It is encouraging to see that, once again, the tourism sector has proven to be resilient and continues to demonstrate its ability to bounce back from the natural disasters and the biggest storms to hit the global economy. Reports indicate that South Africa has welcomed and hosted 4.8 million international tourists from January to July 2023, a 70.6% surge compared to the same period in 2022. Over the same period, domestic travel increased by 23.4%, with more than 18.8 million domestic travelers taking overnight trips compared to 15.2 million last year. Honorable members and compatriots, we have the collective responsibility to safeguard our facilities and infrastructure, protect our communities, and share in the rich history and culture of our nations to grow the tourism sector, particularly in villages, townships, and small dorpies. We must ensure that the government reaches its new targets as set out in the National Tourism Sector Strategy of 2016 to 2026. And these include the in increasing the sector's direct contribution to the GDP from 118 billion in 2015 to 302 billion by 2026. Increasing the number of jobs directly supported by the sector from 702,824 in 2015 to 1 million by 2026. Increasing the sector's export earnings from 115 billion rents in 2015 to 359 billion rents by 2026. Increasing capital investment in the sector from 64 billion in 2015 to 148 a billion rand by 2026. The strategy acknowledges the need for intergovernmental coordination, an integrated planning approach, and private sector involvement for the successful implementation and for the realization of inclusive and high quality growth of the South African tourism economy. The strategy also requires that effective coordinating mechanism be established at provincial and local government levels to synergize efforts and optimize the allocation and the use of resources. Industrialization is a key driver of economic development. The 2019-2024 MTSF focuses on reindustrializing the economy through the creation of environment that enables national property sectors to support industrialization and localization, leading to increased exports, employment, and youth and women-owned SMEs participation, as well as providing support for localization through government procurement strategies. The 2019-2024 MTSF is supported by other policies, such as the special economic zones that support industrialization and the development of industrial capabilities and the one-stop shop concept to facilitate and promote foreign direct investment. The Department of Trade, Industry and Competition introduced a one-stop shop which serves as an entry point for investors needing information about applicable laws and regulation and other relevant matters and performs pre and post screening or investment screening for appropriate investors and investment into the country on a project by project basis. The National One Stop Shop was launched in, May, in March 2017, and it is key to housing all relevant regulatory and administrative departments and agencies in a single location, and this providing investors with an integrated service, uh, with an integrated service. It is vital that the three spheres of government work to improve the country's attractiveness as a destination of choice for doing business. This platform was created to better facilitate the ease of doing business. Honorable House Chairperson, 
the African National Congress believed that the tourism as a, as a sector uh, with many linkages with various other sectors needs to be coordinated through a whole government, uh, through a whole of government and a whole of society approach to ensure that Brand South Africa is positioned in the best way possible to attract investment and pro interest. I thank you, Honorable House Chair. Thanks very much, Honorable Member. Uh, honorable Members, now uh, I would like <clears throat> to recognize Honorable S. Posho, DA. Thank you, House Chair. Please note that we are in load shedding, so my video will not be switched on. Today, I'm standing here to advocate for the proposition that building viable tourism spaces and facilities is undeniably beneficial for local economic development. I firmly believe that when communities embrace tourism as a catalyst for growth, they unlock a world of opportunities, not only for the community, but also for the sustainability of their region. Building viable tourism spaces and facilities for local economic development involves careful planning, investment, and a holistic and sustainable approach. It is important that a balance is found between economic growth, environmental, and cultural preservation, along with community involvement. This, Honorable House Chair, is key to long-term successes. However, it's essential to manage tourism sustainable, sustainably to avoid negative impacts like overdevelopment, environmental degradation, and cultural commodification. The three spheres of government should strike a balance between promoting tourism and preserving the quality of life for residents. Therefore, sustainability in tourism cannot be an option. It has to be the new norm. To be able to achieve this, it is imperative that stakeholder collaboration with shared goals be made an essential foundation. It is by taking hands that South Africa will ensure that sustainable tourism becomes a reality. After the COVID epidem epidemic, the tourism industry changed and it has become apparent that more emphasis should be placed on local and domestic tourism. First and foremost, Tourism is a significant job creator. When we invest in tourism infrastructure, we put local residents to work. Hotels, restaurants, tour guides, and artisans all find gainful employment. These jobs often span a wide range of skills and educational levels, providing opportunities for everyone from entry-level positions to management roles. Tourism also brings in revenue that can be reinvested in the community, from hotel taxes to entrance fees and attractions. The income generator, generated can bolster public services, infrastructure improvements, and education, thus creating a ripple effect of prosperity. Furthermore, the growth of tourism provides a lifeline for small businesses, Local shops, cafes, and souvenir stores thrive as they cater to tourists. This sustains local entrepreneurship and encourages innovation as businesses adapt to the diverse needs of visitors. Tourism can be a guardian of local culture and heritage. When travelers seek authentic experiences, communities are incentivized to preserve their unique traditions languages and historical sites. By building tourism spaces, we give these aspects of our identity the attention and protection they deserve. Developing tourism spaces often necessitates improvements in infrastructure and public services, roads, transportation networks, parks, and sanitation facilities are upgraded, not only benefiting tourists, but also enhancing the quality of life for residents. However, in our more rural areas, this is lacking. Diversification of the local economy is crucial for long-term stability. By investing in tourism, communities reduce their dependency on a single industry. 
This resilience safeguards against economic downturns and ensures a more sustainable future. It is clear that tourism will play an important role in the economic development of local regions and will maximize the impact and role of tourism in local economic development. Local government must be an enabler for local economic development and also for tourism, as tourism is one of the main strategies of local economic development. Lastly, tourism fosters community engagement. It encourages residents to take pride in their surroundings and their heritage. It promotes local artisans, cultural festivals, and the sharing of traditions. Through tourism, communities strengthen their bonds and share their stories with the world. In conclusion, we firmly believe that building viable tourism spaces and facilities is not just a means of economic development, but a pathway to empowerment for local communities. By harnessing the potential of tourism, we empower ourselves to create better lives, preserve our cultures, and safeguard our environment. It is for these regions, Honourable Deputy Minister, that I urge you and your government to recognise that tourism, when managed sustainably and responsibly, can be a beacon of hope and prosperity for our communities and our future. It is therefore imperative that urgent attention is given to infrastructure investment, as stated in your opening remarks, Honourable Deputy Minister. And this is to be done to continue unlocking the potential tourism has in contributing to the GDP of this country. Thank you. Thanks very much. We can't hear you, Honourable Deputy, Honourable Chair, House Chair. Thanks very much, Honourable Member. I would like now to call Honourable Mushodu. ANC, Honorable Mushodu. Um, just look at Toto. It's a Mela, Honorable Mushodu. Oh, who bad? Thank you, thank you, uh, Harche, uh, Amam in Grenya. Uh, allow me to also send a word of greetings to you and the and the leadership of the Eastern Council of Province and my colleagues. And also appreciate uh, the opportunity granted to stand in for Honorable Moshodi. Uh, South Africa's economic recovery and construction plan set up that infrastructure investment delivery and maintenance will be at the center of our recovery. Therefore, localization has to be driven characteristically and supported with special measures, including a strong link with infrastructure investment plan. Pivotal to our economic recovery has been the empowerment of the marginalized in our society, women, young people, persons with disabilities, and military veterans. The ANC government, through the Department of Tourism, has been able to work with various communities and the Development Bank of Southern Africa to ensure that tourism spaces and facilities are viable in order to boost local economic development. In this regard, an infrastructure maintenance program has been implemented in 19 national parks. This includes Zigama in the Eastern Cape, the Golden Gate in the Free State, Apugure in Limpopo, just to mention but a few. 30 community-based tourism projects have also been implemented, and this includes the Anton Lembede Museum in the Echepini municipality, Kazul Natal, the Tamarin Dam in Northwest, and Kamisberg in the Northern Cape. This work is vital in ensuring that tourists, both domestic and international, find it attractive to visit and explore the sites, thereby boosting the local economy and empowering its people. As chair as an organ of state in terms of section 139 of the constitution, the DBA continues to, to display and avail its capacity to provide a credible infrastructure development program through its well-established governance systems, controls, which operate within the confines of the Public Finance, Finance Management Act. Madam members, in addition 
to creating viable tourism spaces and facilities for local economic development. It is prudent that our government has also uh, protect these facilities and tourist or the visitors from vandalism and criminal elements. We are therefore pleased that the Department of Tourism has set aside 124.5 million for the training of more than 2,300 monitors nationwide during the 2023-2024 financial year. The tourism monitor's responsibilities include patrolling, identified attractions, promoting tourism awareness, providing essential information to tourists and reporting any criminal incident to the South African Police Service and other relevant enforcement agencies. These tourism monitors will receive additional training from the South African Police Service and will be deployed as of next month. As chairs, we continue to be confronted with the structural and systematic challenges of high rates of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. The government has recognized the role of small, medium, and micro enterprise as a critical vehicle for poverty alleviation and the reduction of unemployment. Therefore, the tourism industry as an economic sector has shown growth, which has sustained small businesses and created jobs that drive local development. Although large companies dominate the South African tourism industry, a vast number of tourism enterprises fall into the category of SMEs, some of which form part of the informal sector. I'll share the tourism SME and informal sector is largely made up of women and young people. Historical women in South Africa have faced many challenges in the labor market. While women make up 20% of South African society, they are the minority when it comes to business leadership positions. Many of our grandmothers, aunts, and sisters are at the forefront of keeping local economics going. You will find them working in the local restaurant, the local bed and breakfast establishment, the local supermarket. And predominantly, they are also found in the taxi brands and side of the road selling foods and vegetables, sweets, food, and etc. There are more women than men employed in the informal sector. To be precise, 47.6 of women compared to 30.6 of men. Equally, key support sources such as children care are mostly filled by women, and these are areas where they are most vulnerable and they bear the brand of exploitation. Many informal economy workers work under very unfavorable conditions with no proper infrastructure. Women in particular often bring their children along to work with them in conditions where they are no longer shelters, or where no proper toilets, water, or garbage collection points exist. Addressing this unsafe and unhealthy working conditions is also vital to the creation of viable tourism spaces and facilities for local economic development. According to the Labor Resource Service Institute, Income disparities between men and women also exist in the informal sector. Where you will find that early earnings for men are 18 rand as opposed to 13 for women. The self employed who operate business large enough to employ others earn relatively low wages. Median early earnings among this group are only 25 rand for men and 16 rand for women. South African Local Economic Development Network has flagged the absence of suitable legal and regulatory framework. For the informal economy, that's one of the critical challenges that need to be addressed when it comes to women in the informal sector. They argue that local government predominantly addresses informal economy through bylaws, resulting in its neglect of official economy of official economic development, therefore resulting in a gap that exposes women to various abuses. We therefore urge our government to look at reforms to mitigate this. Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization, Surab. Uh, Polika really once said that the United World Tourism Organization has worked with our partners to study and document the huge contribution women make to tourism. And it is time for tourism to give back. With the center stage model, we can help the sector work for women and we will not stop until the girls of tomorrow have the same opportunities as the men of today. This center stage project aims to strengthen, coordinate and focus work towards gender equality in tourism governmental institution and business as they recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Through this project, the United Nations World Tourism Organization supports four uh, national tourism administrations. This is important because it will implement a one-year action plan for women's empowerment, which includes targeted training programs, measures to boost female career progression, improvement to the legal framework and the connection of 
sex desegregated tourism employment data. Much work is being done at an international level and national to fast track the inclusion of women into the mainstream tourism economy and acknowledge their contribution. We are also pleased that the Department of Tourism is consistent in maintaining a minimum of 40% procurement spend on women-owned businesses. The ANC welcomes that the Women in Tourism Business Development and Support Program has been able to support 225 women-owned small, medium, and micro enterprises and has been implementing nationally through coaching and mentorship. Four domestic tourism careers campaigns have been implemented in Free State, Northwest, and Hunting. 500 SMEs and 2,500 unemployment, unemployed and trained youth were trained on norms and standards for safe tourism operations in all nine provinces. An additional 98 SMEs and 17 tourism operations in all nine provinces. An additional 98 SMEs and 17 unemployed and retrenched youth were trained. The department has been offering tourism and hospitality skills development programs through the expanded public works program funding. An incubation program has also been implemented to support tourism SMEs through incubators dealing with technology, tower operators, and food services. A lot is being done, however much more still needs to be done to ensure that conditions are favorable for women who operate in tourism SMEs and the informal sector so that they are given equal opportunities and support to enable them to provide for themselves and their families while also positively contributing to the growth and development of our local economies. In conclusion, House Chair, through public-private partnership, our government has been able to support tens of thousands of small businesses and cooperatives, thereby creating and sustaining nearly 400,000 jobs. Social compacts, which are inclusive of everyone in the tourism value chain, have the potential to grow the sector and better advance the agenda of building viable tourism spaces and facilities for local economic development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, now I would like to call Honorable Ryder, DA. Honorable Ryder. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, House Chairperson. Um, <clears throat> thank you. My fellow victims, let me tell you about a beautiful stretch of land on the banks of the Val Dam. This piece of land has approximately seven kilometers of dam frontage, creating a fisherman's paradise. There are ablution blocks every 120 meters, making this resort ideal for camping. A large hall, several clusters of chalets, and a set of offices for administration make up the rest of the scene. Sounds idyllic, doesn't it? Well, once upon a time it was, but if you go there today, you'll find the place abandoned, vandalized, and avoided by law-abiding citizens out of fear for their safety. The place is called Government Farm, or Island Shore, depending on who you speak to. And as the name implies, it's owned by the government and managed by the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure, who have been unable to do anything with the property due to nothing more than their own incompetence. And let's be honest, it's not because of a lack of of potential willing partners. The Midvale local municipality has written to the department asking for access to the property to run it as a tourism destination, specifically to enhance local economic development. Midvale have developed a plan, they've undertaken feasibility studies and viability assessments, and they've presented these to the community. But the response from public works has been stony silence. You see, there's no opportunity for brown envelope for carders. Now let's look towards the Seikobos Runt Nature Reserve in the southeast of Gauteng. It's a green lung in our industrial province, about 45 minutes drive from the bustling Santon CBD. It's a haven for hikers and adventure cyclists. Well, it should be. The reserve is operated by the Gauteng province. 
Once there was a thriving resort in the reserve, operated by one of the top hotel chains in the country. But when it came time to renew the lease, other priorities meant that the hotel chain was rejected as a partner by the ANC-led Gauteng government. So instead, the buildings were left to stand empty and have now degraded to a point where substantial investment would be needed to get the resort up and running again. Investment that our government certainly cannot afford and that no businessman will contemplate while the ANC government plays games with security of tenure. Another prime opportunity for a tourism boost that this government has wasted. And these are not isolated issues. There are just two that I have had personal experience with. Others abound, like the issues that I learned about from the Buffalo City Councillors Dinesh Vallab, Funeka Wolose, and uh, Councillor Chandra. The once thriving harbour-side restaurants at Latimer's Landing are all deserted because of failures by public works to renew the leases. Abandoned buildings around the harbour, owned by Transnet, have created safe havens for criminals and building hijackers. Long grass and apathetic police make the area unsafe for tourists. There's a development called Waterworld on the West Bank. It's been well designed and well planned, but construction has never been finished. The beachfront, beachfront development on the Eastern Beach has been incomplete for 20 years while the government dithers and talks. Yes, white elephants abound. There's also the Tiwani Resort on the way to Port Alfred. Again, well designed, but totally inaccessible due to a road that has never been constructed. The picture that emerges is a lack of coordination in government, where tourism doesn't talk to business, public works talks a lot to business and tourism, but it doesn't actually do anything. And Transnet, of course, doesn't talk or listen to anybody. Municipalities are generally ignored, and cooperative governance across the spheres is non-existent. Now, honorable members, contrast this with the DA-led Western Cape, where we've heard about many additional flights and routes that have been negotiated with various airlines, some of them new to South African routes. These are not by accident, but as a direct result of provincial government using its various resources, including Westro, to talk tourism to key players, to consult and involve local municipalities, and most importantly, to act on the advice, guidance, and support of local tourism players. Just look at the work of Cape Town Mayor Jordan Hill Lewis, who realized that uh, tourism in the CBD needed a shot in the arm following the COVID lockdowns. He shut down streets on Thursday nights to create safe zones for people to come and enjoy themselves in the CBD and spend money at the restaurants and shops. The events are well policed to ensure the safety of visitors and therefore very well attended. The Minister of Unemployment had a lot to say recently about the fact that the Western Cape creates jobs because it is lucky enough to have a mountain and the sea. Perhaps he forgot that Durban has got the Drakensberg and the warm Indian Ocean, certainly a much nicer ocean to swim in and enjoy for the water sports. The Eastern Cape has got the beauty of the wild coast and, of course, the Amatole Mountains right there. The luck is not in having the natural resources. The luck is, in fact, having voters who understand that their votes translate into their quality of life. The lip service from the ANC here today really is an insult to the tourism operators of South Africa, an industry waiting to provide tens of thousands of jobs. But our tourism minister is too busy doing the pencil test on tourism operators to determine if they qualify for funding. Fellow South Africans, we should not remain victims of this, country, this government. Vote for your future, South Africa. Vote for the party who cares about tourism, who cares about creating jobs, and cares about improving lives. Thank you. Thanks very much, Honorable Ryder. And I'll like now to call Honorable Debrain, FF Plus, Honorable Debrain. Thank you, House Chair. Honorable House Chair, tourism is a, is a tremendous source of potential income and opportunity for our communities. It can be a catalyst for local economic growth and development. And when done right, tourism offers many possibilities to create jobs, promote small businesses, and showcase local crafts and cultures. 
And it is important to recognize that the development of tourism sector is beneficial for everyone in our communities. But to build a successful tourism spaces and facilities, we must start by identifying our community's unique features and resources to attract visitors. And these may include natural beauty, historical sites, cultural heritage, and local traditions. And by honoring and preserving these characteristics, we can create a unique and appealing experience for tourists visiting our communities. Dan mag waar voorzitter is het belangrijk om te verzekeren dat ons toerisme ruimtes en faciliteiten toegerus wordt met die nodige infrastructuur en dienste om toeristen gemakkelijk te kan accommoderen. Dat sluit een goede verblijf, geriefelijke restauranten, veilige vervoerstelsels en een verschijnheid van activiteiten voor bezoekers. En door hierdie faciliteiten te ontwikkel, zal ons gemeenschap in staat stel om in die toerisme sector te floreren en te groei. En voorzitter, dit is als redelijk van zelfsprekend. Maar om dit, om dit te bewerkstellig, zal een samenwerking van alle departementen moet wees. Tans in Zuid-Afrika is daar niet een enkele spruit vier of dam wat niet besoedel is met rauwe oor als gevolg van municipaliteit tussen onvermoe en die onvermoe van die departement van omgevingszake om hierdie besoedeling aan te spreken en te beheer nie. Die gehalte van ons paie en algemene vervoerstelsels is van so hard dat gemeenschappen niet eens toegang het tot basisse dienste nie. En wat nog te praat van toeriste veilig te vervoer nie. Vier jaar lang het die een na die ander minister van vervoer hierdie verval veroorzaak en slechts leerbeloftes van ontwikkeling en onderhoud gepropageer met geen succes in die. Die huidige krachtkrisis en die economische inpak daarvan op ons plaaslijke gemeenskampe is bezig om plaaslijke bezigheden en entrepreneurs land te leen en die een na die ander en sluit hulle dier as gevolg hiervan. Dit terwijl ons thans drie ministers het wat oorzicht het oor Eskom en die energiekrisis in Zuid-Afrika. Voorzitter, zo kunnen ons elke departementse mislukking en onvermoe wat bijdraagt door die sikkelende toerisme bedrijf opnoem. Maar die feit blijft dan, dat zolang de ANC in bewind is, sal hierdie omstandighede net vererger en sal die toerisme bedrijf, soos die rest van Zuid-Afrika, net verder ten gronde gaan. En Jeppes en I agree with the Honorable Minister. Tourism has the potential to ensure economic growth and prosperity for our communities. But while the ANC is governing every single department and this country into the ground, economic growth and prosperity will remain but a distant dream. And hopefully after the 2024 elections, when we have a new government and functional departments, tourism in South Africa will reach its true potential. Thank you. Thanks very much, honorable member. Now, honorable members, I would like now to call honorable AI Seleko. As Kruba, as Kruba, as Kruba, as Seleko. I'm going to say, 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 I'm going to Minister of Electricity is still struggling to get a plan of taking us out of low shedding, but we continue. I will not use papel. I use papel. Honourable member, order. Honourable Ndongeni, order. Honourable, like here the underwear brought me deep as a fourteen voordeur van de Westkapse Provinciale Parlement, omdat dat die net een zaak van economische en statistieke is nie, maar een waar die levens van ons burgers gemeenschappen en die toekomst van onze provincie aanraak. The data I present today is not mere conjecture. It is backed by vigorous vetting from the Provincial Minister of Finance and Economic Opportunities and offers a compelling insight into the transformative power of tourism in the Western Cape. In the past year alone, international tourists visiting our Western Cape have generated an awe-inspiring 24.3 billion fortifying our economy and supporting a staggering 10,600 jobs. To break it down further, for every 100 international tourists who venture into our province, they bring with them 2.1 million in direct tourist spending, which in turn contributes 500,000 to our provincial gross domestic product. This infusion of capital enables the creation of local jobs, fostering employment opportunities for our communities and supports the movement of 1.4 million worth of air cargo, further catalyzing economic activity. Let these numbers resonate. They are not just statistics on a page. They are a testament to the potential 
and the power of tourism industry in the Western Cape. Since 2015, we have witnessed remarkable progress in our air connectivity. Cape Town and the Western Cape have been directly connected to, to 10 new African destinations. And as recently as June of this year, to Manzini and Lusaka. This has increased the total number of cross-border African destinations served out of Cape Town to 15, all facilitated by 11 operating airlines. Furthermore, the African seat capacity that has been on an impressive upward trajectory, growing at a compound annual growth rate of 10% per year between 2015 and 2023. This growth has culminated in 555,000 inbound seats, a substantial increase from 250 seats we had in 2015. The Cape Town Air Access projects aim to enhance our air connectivity to the Western Cape, in achieving these remarkable milestones. By improving air connectivity and growing air cargo capacity, we have achieved improved businesses business competitiveness by making our destinations more accessible on the global stage. The numbers of international two-way passengers through Cape Town International Airport in the first seven months of 2023 are nothing short of astounding. They saw a 69% increase compared to the same period in 2022, reaching a remarkable 1.6 million passengers. This growth continued to strengthen throughout the year According to the airport's company South Africa AXA, with international two-day passengers reaching 1.6 million in the first seven months of 2023. This exceeded pre-pandemic levels by 106% year-to-date and grew by an impressive 69% compared to the same period in 2022. Domestically, our province is thriving as well, with 3.8 million domestic two-way passengers passing through city CTIA between January and July 2023, based on AXA data. Even George Airport, a critical gateway to, for our province, witnessed a 3% year-on-year increase with 449, 837 two-way passengers between January and July 2023. The attraction of tourists to our diverse and beautiful Western Cape is undeniable, Footfall, a 21 participating attraction across the six regions of our province, recorded a total of 469,854,000 visitors in July 2023. This marks a remarkable 40% growth in the number of visitors compared to July 2022. The arrival of 605,000 foreign passengers injected 24.3 billion into the Western Cape economy in 2022 alone, supporting a substantial 10,600 jobs. This means that for every 100 international passengers traveling to Cape Town and the Western Cape, 2.1 million is generated in direct tourism spend. Notably, the same 100 passengers also support the movement of 1.4 million worth of air cargo to the province. Dit is die echter net die cijfers wat die story vertel nie. Dit is die verhaal van individie. Gesinne en gemeenskappe wie sy levens positief beinvloed is dier hier die sector. Dit is die kelners in ons restaurante, die gisse by ons aantrekkelijke, by die aantrekkelijke neid, die hotelpersoneel wat besoekers van recht oor die wereld verwelkom en die entrepreneurs wat sukses in die toerisme bedrijf bevind het. Dit is die ouders wat, die, wat vir hulle kinders kan zorg, die studenten wat hulle drome kan nastreef en die gemeenskappe kan floreer en as gevolg van toerisme. The Western Cape tourism sector continues to shine with tourist arrival via air to Cape Town International Airport in the first six months of 2023, exceeding pre-pandemic levels. This is a testament to the resilience and allure of our province as a tourist destination. Moreover, international two-day passengers have been, remained robust between January and June 2020, 2024. While we celebrate these achievements, we must also emphasize the critical importance of tourism safety. The City of Cape Town Tourism Safety Law Enforcement Unit deserved our heartfelt appreciation for ensuring a safe 2022-23 summer tourism season. 
Their dedicated efforts have resulted in a total of 4,264 safety intervention conducted by this unit, over and above regular policing and law enforcement activities. In December alone, this intervention included 1,514 patrols, assisted to 488 tourists with safety and general queries. Responses to 497 complaints, handling out fines where the city bylaws were broken and assisting in three arrests. Their work is essential in creating an inviting and secure environment for our visitors. Events are another vital aspect of our tourism industry. The Cape Town Sevens, the renowned Two Oceans Marathon, and the recent Eprix event have been remarkable contributors to our local and provincial economy. The Two Oceans Marathon, for instance, annually injects a staggering 672 million into our local and provincial economy. The recent Epics event, which is a testament to our province's growing reputation as a major sporting hub, contributed a remarkable two billion. In closing, the Western Cape tourism sector is not just about statistics of or economic growth. It is about the people of our province. It is about the future we are building for them and the opportunities we are creating. It's about showcasing our region's natural beauty, cultural richness, and warm hospitality to the world. I want to highlight the exceptional work done by the way by Westgro and did that in promoting tourism in our province. They are hard at work bringing new airlines and cruise ships, innovating with social media and promoting the Western Cape as a world-class tourism destination. As we move forward, let us pledge our unwavering support to these initiatives for they are the vehicles that will drive our province to even greater heights in tourism, local economic development, and prosperity for our people. Thank you very much, Nkosi Kakulu, Bayadanki, Nkosi, House Chair. Nkosi, Honorable Member, Honorable Members, now we continue with our list. I would like to call Honorable N. Tafeni, EFF. Honorable Tafeni. Uh, Ngozi Chairperson, Mandibulele El Tuba, Dikela Ugu Ivala Ivito, because the network yam Aik Zinzang. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Uh, oh, Chairperson. Okay, thank you. Chairperson, I stand here today in the House for the very first time to debate tourism spaces and facilities for local economic development a sector that is central to the growth and development of this country. This is a debate which takes place at the backdrop of a very dark period of our country where crime is very high, unemployment and poverty rise, and the majority of our people landless. The month of September marked as Tourism Month, where tourism is celebrated and recognized for its economic potential and its contribution to poverty alleviation. However, it is disappointing to note how tourism benefits in South Africa do not actually trickle down to poor communities. Uh, tourism development in township and rural areas remain far from being advanced. Township here once thought of a vibrant spaces filled with historical or heritage and political tourism, but under the minister which and under the minister watch, they are known only as crime, as, as crime spot where, to, where foreign tourists go to die. This minister has failed to re, re, revitalize South Africa tourism and has overlooked the need to boost it. We know this to be true as, tourist, as tourism enterprises still face a number of challenges in how they are run. Black entrepreneurs face challenges such as, as lack of access to financial, so, financial sources and lack of findings, as there is exist little to no, no support offered by government for small entra, entrepreneurs. Black entrepreneurs struggle getting funding even when viable, uh, when viable business plans and are made available. Chairperson, there also exists very little evidence that the poor actually benefit from tourism. Small business based in township fail competition and are not protected from outdoor quite on the tall operators who have entered these spaces. 
It is also disappointing to note how tourism is still standard around areas such as Soweto in Gauteng, where activities is clustered in Orlando West are, are, around where the Vilagas Hector Peterson presence in, in located. Soweto currently hold an advantage of over the township in South Africa as in drones visitors because of its struggle history legacy and attraction and its significant historical event such as the 16 june uprising and cause due to its close proximity to johannesburg year in year in and year out Gauteng is the province that receives the most international visitors whilst other townships such as eastern k province and free state do not have such an advantage Gauteng and the western cape experience the majority of tourist weather for business or le leisure, and the provinces have not com compete for a piece of the pie. The minister has failed to address issues of inequality development, specifically in rural communities, and it has ignored rural tourism or leisure activities, which could be developed further in areas such as Onaitowa and Nasekomani. There exists a lack of capacity building of the state, especially at local government level, where there is a lack of management skills and capital with, with which to expand the rural tourist infrastructure. Local communities are often disregarded and are not involved in planning and decision-making process so as to ensure that tourism development align with the needs of our people. Roads and transport are in a state of disrepair, and it is difficult for tourists to access the township. This said also has also made no effort at enhancement gender equality, and instead we find that gender inequality still exists in this sector, as entrepreneurship is mostly dominated by males. Women, women still only participate when they are hired as domestic workers or employed for cleaning purposes. Chairperson, there has been no believable of plans or policies put in place which focus in skills development and entrepreneurship for women and persons with disabilities. It, mu it must once again to be made clear that women are capable and must be given opportunities to uh, operate as tour guides, guides, rangers, drivers, as well as, as guest house operators and managers. Chairperson, I could, I could go all day listing the challenges which need to be overcome if the rural and township tourism sector is to achieve any of its goals. I could go further and speak about how province and local governments still need to do more to improve tourism infrastructure, such as the road, as a matter of agency of tourism. Business are ever to grow and be viable. How maintenance of infrastructure should be established on a regular basis, and how there currently exists a lack of leadership in providing skills training and business that up. Uh, in my in and as the economic freedom fighters continues to mark its 10 year anniversary we are reminded of the work which lies ahead of us as an organization when we take over in 2024 as such we encourage all south africans to register to vote for the eff in the upcoming elections thank you chairperson as bong and mama siya bong. Uh, honorable members, Sia Kuba, I would now like to call Honorable N. Khatebe, IFP, Babu Pungan. Um, thank you so much, um, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members. Statistics South Africa has revealed that South Africa's tourism sector is larger than both the manufacturing and agricultural sectors making it a crucial driver of the domestic economy, catering to both leisure and business travel. Tourism is an essential pillar of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals, especially Goals 8, 12, and 14. 
Goal 8 specifically references economic growth and the importance of employment opportunities. Statistics South Africa has reported that our tourism sector continues to exhibit a strong recovery with the first half of 2023, recording more than 4 million tourist arrivals, which is a significant increase increase from the 2.3 million tourist arrivals between January and June 2022. This leads me to question how this surge of tourists has led to sustainable employment opportunities for the local communities in these tourist hotspots. The economies of many rural areas in our country are reliant on tourism. Therefore, we need to continuously find new and creative ways in which we can harness the opportunities created by an influx of tourists in these areas. I put it to you that the solution lies within the greater public-private partnership initiatives. One example of this is a private sector initiative called the Youth for Tourism, launched by the Youth Employment Service and Financial Service Group Sunlab. The primary objective of Youth for Tourism is to unite various businesses in unlocking the untapped potential of the tourism industry by creating over 1,000 jobs for young individuals in its initial phase. The, this initiative aims to support thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises. The government's investment in these initiatives would be vital as it would increase the number of employment opportunities that can be created. Unfortunately, whilst the plans on paper may seem wonderful, the supporting infrastructure need that no longer exists and is in the state of decay that is rendered useless. Take, for example, an area that is heavily reliant on local tourism, such as the Okashamba area in northern KZN. This area is host to some of the world's most amazing landscapes and holiday destinations that are the envy of first world countries. Due to poor supporting road infrastructure, many internationally recognized resorts have been forced to close down, shed jobs, and operate in ways that merely keep them afloat. To make matters worse, the roads due to their condition are dangerous to our own people. They are unsafe to long walk, to walk, to walk along as, ve- as vehicles have no option but to dangerously cross onto the oncoming side of the road to avoid potholes in some instances. Honorable Chairperson, in closing, we can only reach one conclusion, and that is government has not paid attention to the needs of the maintenance of public infrastructure, and it has now reached a point where it negatively affects the country's development path. To resolve such issues, government departments need to sit regularly and work out a development plan together where their work complement each other and not silo-based budgets. I thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Bungane. Uh, Honorable members, I would like now to recognize Honorable Badenhaus, uh, DA. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Um, you know, one can only wonder, um, and welcome, Honorable Deputy Minister and uh, fellow members. Um, one can only wonder if the Deputy Minister of Tourism knows as much about tourism as what he knows about operating his Zoom camera on the Zoom platform. But be that as it may, um, tourism is one of the very few industries in South Africa that has escaped the full effect of uh, ANC incompetence. Maybe it's just because the Tuli House cadres just don't understand how to how how how, op- how to operate in tourism and how it works. Maybe it's just because there aren't as many clear cut opportunities in tourism for looting as in the other industries in the country. Tourism survived and often flourished in spite of the worst thrown at the industry by our cadres in green, black, and yellow. The incapacity of this government to roll out e-visas is a case in point. The incapacity to ensure enough friendly custom officials that ensure security, but also treat tourists as the assets that they really are. The inability to ensure the safety and security of tourists, both local and international, by having an effective police system. The inability to ensure functioning access routes to communities 
that has the potential to tap into the tourism market, yet they left behind due to a cadre stealing the money for a new road instead of the entire region benefiting from tourism. The complete failure to process and issue the necessary operator permits for reputable service providers to function legally and continue to deliver safe and reliable experiences. The DA has, in fact, long advocated for South Africa to step up and to take our place as the number one tourism destination in Africa and one of the top tourism destinations in the world. How will we fix this? We need to be attractive to investors that will help grow our economy. Policy clarity is paramount and having more of the same will not help. Change have proven local and regional policies of the Western Cape implemented at the national level. Government should be an, an, an enabler, create the right environment that will encourage greater involvement of entrepreneurs and then prioritize support programs for the tourism industry, helping everyone irrespective of the color of their skins. Evidence-based decision-making is critical in tailoring products and services that will meet the demands of both the international and local markets. The research and information gathering should be facilitated by a competent department. Let me reiterate that, a competent department. As mentioned above, we are failing rural communities and entire tourism micro industries by not putting in place the basic infrastructure to connect the tourists to the unique experience offered by our diverse country and its people. Honorable Chai, you referred to it. You said uh, you will not increase tourism you said we need to increase tourism in townships, village, and clan dorpies. The fact is, Honorable Chai, we will not increase tourism in townships, villages, and clan dorpies if tourists can't physically get to those villages, townships, and clan dorpies. You know, in most European countries, tourists are used to driving on the left side of the road. If you go to any place north of the Western Cape, tourists have to drive on what is left of the road. There simply isn't any infrastructure. It's been proven time and time again that if government works together with private sector, with clear defined roles and supporting one another, constructive engagements will generate positive outcomes for all. Just look at the beautiful examples given by my colleague, the Honorable Seleko of the Western Cape Legislature. We need to ensure that educational foundation is laid, that tourism is again seen as an attractive career opportunity and that the necessary skills are transferred for the industry to, to easily absorb individuals who will hit the ground running and add value to ensure that successes are achieved. Very, very interesting, Honorable Moimang, that you say that the South African economic recovery will only take place when we start developing tourism. The fact of the matter is, South African economic recovery will only take place once this ineffective incapable ANC government is replaced at the 2024 electoral election boxes. The bottom line is, and we are now going to be subjected for the next 15 minutes to Honorable Dangor, who's already uh, shown this morning that his hearing aids a little bit uh, defective. Um, we're going to be subjected to 15 minutes of his soliloquy about how great the ANC is. The bottom line is, while the rest of the ANC controls South Africa to talk Talking the, the DA-controlled Western Cape is winning the tourist walk. We'll see you at the ballot boxes in 2024. Thank you very much, Jane. Thanks very much, Honourable Member. I would like now to recognize Honourable Dango, ANC Ambassador. Honourable Dango. Honorable Dango. He can't hear. Honorable Dango. He's getting, he's getting batteries for his hearing aid. Now, there's an insult, an indignity. Luckily, I can joke about that because I also all really re all respect for black people. Tango.
Let's move on, please. Another presiding Order, officer. Honourable members, Honourable Tango. No, I think we can move on, Chief. Sisa Okuba. Sisa Okuba. Yeah, Honorable Tango. I propose we move on. Okay, Sisa Okuba. Uh, now I would like to recognize the Deputy Minister of Tourism, Honorable Masalela. Ubano Kulmai Maj. Well, let's call it a day. It says, it, it says give him a minute. He's struggling to log back. He was kicked out. How's uh, He's trying to log in. No, thank you, Chair. I'm Mashalela. Mashalela. No, no, thank you very much, Chair. Well, yes, honourable member. Both of them. Who is both of them? Masalele. No, Masalela, not Masalele. Who about honourable member? No, no, no. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, you. It, it Masalela. Is... Masale? Yes. Wait. Masalela. Yeah, that's me. Okay, we've now sorted the surname okay. out. Can we carry on? Thank you. You can continue, Honourable. No, no, uh, thank you very much, Chair and Honourable Members. I'm, I'm, I'm back in Chairperson. <clears throat> I'm back in Chairperson. <clears throat> no, this is not appropriate, eh? Over oh, down. Okay, yeah. going to, uh, uh, Deputy Minister, can we, can we give uh, Honorable uh, Dango to finish? Oh, the country is laughing at this. Uh, Honorable just Dango. To you, person, this morning when other people were struggling to log in, uh, the Honorable Rider didn't make such comments, including himself uh, that was struggling to log in. So, however, <clears throat> we all suffer from he was not struggling. the same kinds of issues and Sometimes we have the same kind of solutions. Uh, honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, Honorable Members, we meet here today as we are concluding our celebrations of the Heritage Month and, this, and embracing the beauty of our diversity. As patriots of South Africa and the South African nation, we are proud of our uh, sports uh, figures at the moment, the Springboks doing what they do and we need to look at the various rich and cultural and varied heritages that we have which are profound and as former President Nelson Mandela once said it is against this understanding that the ANC as the government has always advocated for the support and growth of cultural tourism in order to boost the local uh, economy and empower small and informal businesses. Uh, the United Nations World Tourism Organization classified cultural tourism as the type of um, tourism activity which the visitors essentially will, will will be motivated to experience and consume the various cultural uh, attractions that produce a society. I am going to have a problem with load shedding again uh, just now, so I may be intermittent. So please forgive me. South Africa is world-renowned for our rich culture and history, and almost every part of our society as a district and an iconic story to tell, from Mshraba in the KwaZulu-Natal to the San uh, areas of the Cape and the cradle of humankind outside of Johannesburg. 
which is one of the richest homicide and hominid fossil sites in the world, to Soweto heritage sites and trail, which has been criticized as taking most of the tourism to coming into the area. Supporting cultural tourism is not only a boost for our local economies and job creation capacity, it can also lead to the regeneration of rural and urban areas and the preservation of our natural and cultural heritage, thereby bringing us closer together as tourism in our unity and diversity. I want to return to a visit, a recent visit to Germany. And in that visit, we discovered some very interesting things. One is that the German constitution is a federal constitution, ours is a unity constitution. However, the states and the provinces that we have and the states that they have, have, co have developed a new attitude of co-opetition rather than competition, um, and they will cooperate together to provide for Germany as it is. Now, they would do so on a binational basis, on a bilateral basis, and bring in all the motor forces, business, the trade unions, the political entities, all of them will act in concert and not some act as if they don't belong to a South Africa and they're not nationalists. So the appeal is that we need to all move forward as a national movement to provide the kind of changes that we, that we need to do. You know, after 300 and some odd years of apartheid, the transformation was not going to be easy. And we all know that. And when in 1994, President Mandela mooted for a state of national unity, he did so recognizing that that transformation is going to take all of us. It's going to take every force and every motor force from wherever they come to provide the kind of change that is needed and the development. The electricity was designed for a certain percentage of people, as were all other resources. It was designed for a particular uh, a, a, a section of the populace. It now is to supply the entire populace. And that is the difference between generation and use and consumption. There is a big gap between generation and consumption. The appeal is really, let us get together as South Africans to produce the kind of society that we would want of non-racialism, non-sexism, and a democratic South Africa that serves all of its people and the needs of all of its people, including the needs of the rural people, uh, building the roads, which will actually facilitate tourism, building the tourism facilities, which will make it easier. If Gauteng and the Western Cape uh, and KwaZulu-Natal receives most of the tourists, we should actually be encouraging the development of other provinces and facilities in those provinces together. Let us bring our ideas together. At the moment, I'm, all I'm hearing is that we are in an election campaign, so we'll make all kinds of speeches to be get elected. You know, elections is not the only thing in politics. The transformation of society is in fact going to be more important than elections. Elections is one method and one plank of struggle to bring about a democratic society. It is not the totality thereof. Having said that, I want to just make an appeal to the office bearers that if officials are producing a legal document, that we should respect that and not be disrespectful of those legal personalities that serve us and actually create the legislation that we pass. That if we have criticism of them, there's another form to, uh, to do that, there's another forum to do that, but to actually sit here and criticize uh, the legal uh, section of parliament 
is not very, very tasteful. So my appeal is to the office bearers, please look at this, please address this issue, and let us get on with it. But my appeal is, united as South Africa, in the words and the, the sense of pro former President Mandela in 1994, to achieve the transformation of this country is going to take all of us. But to play football politics is not going to achieve anything else. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Honorable Dango. Honorable members, I would like now to recognize Honorable F. Mahalela, Deputy Minister on Tourism. Over to you, Deputy Minister. No, no, thank, thanks, uh, Chair, Chair, and members who have participated in the debate. Uh, well, it is evident clear that uh, uh, all challenges raised uh, by some honorable members uh, will continue to be a challenge unless they are addressed not just by government alone, by, by government and every sector, which is required to play a meaningful role in dealing with the problem and the challenges of an infrastructure in order to unlock the local uh, uh, economic benefits. While some of the members, the issue there was in, uh, sometimes you, you, you don't believe they are living in South Africa. Uh, or if they do live in South Africa, it means they, they don't make research. Uh, they just raise statement which has got no backing or no support. As government, we 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 are working with all the spheres of government. The things that somebody is mentioning about what how we Cape or Cape Town is doing, it's not an isolated incident of Cape Town. It is a work that is done by government as a whole, supported by the South African tourism. All provinces are working with SAT to promote all the provinces on an equitable basis. But as you know, the other provinces that will have more advantages, not because they are doing something extraordinary, no, because of the historical fact. Uh, the historical fact that uh, in terms of promotion, uh, for many years, promotion was mainly targeted at Western Cape and Kruger National Park. So that's why they became the most popular destination in South Africa. Not because of a miracle done by any other party, so-called DA. No, it's not that. Uh, the other thing that members must understand is that there's a lot of community work that we're doing, developed community projects in villages. If we are able to read your APP, which we table in this, in this house, you will see the intervention we're making in rural areas, in small towns and dorms, on a variety of community projects that we're, in, we're building. Currently, we're running about 29 projects. We've been running, maintaining all the, the, the national parks so that they become viable. We have been working with provinces to identify some of the natural parks that needs to be revamped. And we are working with those provinces to assist them in making sure that we revamp those, those national parks. So that this provincial park, so that they are they are able to be integrated to the national tourism space, and be able to provide services. We are providing skills. We are training various skills, working together with cats. Uh, this coming Saturday, Friday, will be will will be having the national tourism career expo, where we are exposing the entire country into the careers that the uh, individuals who children who want to pursue tourism 
they can be able to look into and, 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 and participate. But a fundamental problem in the tourism sector is lack of transformation. That there's still a concentration of ownership and management in the hands of a few. Unfortunately, that few happens to have a particular race. Unfortunately, that few happens to be male. So those are the problems that are there, which are structural by nature, which we need to work together to deal with them. We have to drive volumes and increase the numbers of tourists visiting South Africa. We have to increase tourism spending while in the country. We have to increase their, their length of stay and increase their average number of provinces visited. By each, by each tourist. Currently, it's only at one point one and a half provinces per, per tourist and also addresses the challenges that we have of seasonality. The five vital components of the tourism system, which are attraction, uh, accessibility, accommodation, amenities, and activities, must be our own drive to unlock the potential uh, of economic growth. Tourism generates income and creates easily accessible trading opportunities and jobs, as well as safe markets, services, and local products. Infrastructure revenue from tourism can be used to expand other important sectors such as transport, your energy, and your waste management. Therefore, the issue of not about creating, building viable tourism spaces and facilities for LEDs, but it is about ensuring that our municipality understand the needs of the visitors' attraction to access, to accommodation, to amenities, as well as local awareness and keeping all our towns as clean as possible we can. When we understand all of this, the as impact you of, uh, when we understand all of this, the, the impact of visitors to the local economy as well as their road, as well as their needs, are likely to plan better. The department is that is responsible for roads, they must build roads. But that are responsible for water, they must provide water. Those that are responsible for amenities must make sure that amenities are made available. So these are some of the things that we, we need to understand, that it is a collaborative effort and we should work together and not, and not, and not throwing stones eh, 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 as if we are living in another country. We are all South Africans. We've got an obligation to build this country together. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Deputy Minister. Uh, honorable members, that concludes the debate. I wish to thank the Deputy Minister, MECs, all Parliament special and special delegate for availing themselves for the debate. Honorable members, that concludes the business of the day. The House is adjourned. Thank you, Mamas. The bonga, Mama. The bonga, Honorable DM. Recording stopped. Mama. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>